<laughs> I, I want to say it was Chris Meller. It was great to see you uh, present this morning. I've been reading your stuff for many, many years now, and former NetApper, former uh, industry implementer myself. It was thanks for presenting this morning. It was really awesome. Uh, I think you might be one of the more polarizing writers in the industry, and it creates a lot of fun for us, uh, especially as vendors. So thank you for that. Um, this is me. Great. Do I look like the picture? No. Um, most people know me from my NetApp days, but before that, about 10 or 12 years, I was actually a, an implementer. I actually did stuff, right? I didn't just make PowerPoint presentations. Um, so for, across the financial and the healthcare and the government space, defense space, and stuff like that, doing a lot of implementations, uh, I really started out as a Microsoft guy. I was doing tier one apps, uh, AD and exchange migrations around Y2K, all that fun stuff that I'm sure a lot of us lived through. Um, and somehow found my way to the dark side and turned vendor uh, around 2010 and uh, really uh, made my ways. So I run datacenterdude.com, uh, do some writing over there, not as active as I have been in the past, but getting ready to get loud again, so stay tuned for that. <clears throat> so I like to talk about, you know, referencing some of that stuff, how we got here. And really it started with a bunch of racks and stuff in servers. And every server had its own dedicated storage, whether that was DAZ or JBOT or local uh, to the bus, whatever. SCSI, right? Good, good fun times. The problem with that, though, is that it led to further isolation and further silos amongst the applications. And I would argue that even further, it siloed teams within your, your infrastructure. So not only was it a way of breaking down or, or siloing the pieces of infrastructure and gear themselves, but it actually separated your teams, and you had these little fiefdoms evolve, and nobody, who, nobody knew what the other teams were doing, and that's where we got storage admins, and network admins, and server admins, and, right? Everybody knows all this stuff. But then VMware came in and saved the day, right? We had all this collapse, and it was great, and it was consolidation. A lot of the stuff Enrico was just talking about around secondary storage and that consolidation, a lot of that was the same fundamental reasons why we did virtualization, but there was a problem, right? Sprawl, just it exploded. We had VMs are free all of a sudden, right? So everybody wanted more VMs and more VMs and more VMs, and they, well, they didn't want termination dates on them. They just wanted them indefinitely. Sprawl for days. And I would even argue that that was, I call this the whack-a-mole ecosystem. And I think VMware and virtualization are directly responsible for this huge explosion that we've had of all of these individual little tiny solutions that do one thing. They solve one problem and they went and created a business out of it. And then we had, you know, whack-a-mole. 10 different business units fire up for to 10 different solutions. And it, the funny thing is, is it comes full circle. So even though we consolidated around virtualization, we created this whole ecosystem that again, one team, one solution, one expert, right? All the same problems. So getting back to, we, we use the old iceberg analogy. Data Domain used it 10 years ago. It still uh, holds water. <laughs> Um, primary storage, kind of carrying on what Enrico was talking about, uh, is kind of where all the press is. It's where all the big spend is. It's where the, uh, the industry's, really their primary focus is around. Anything that's SLA driven, mission critical performance, it's getting the most attention, right? But we've, we've left these soldiers on the battlefield. We've kind of forgotten about these guys. The last real innovation we had in the, in the backup space, in my opinion, is probably data domain with their inline DDoP appliance, right? And that was 10 years ago at this point. That's very scary to say out loud, but that was almost 10 years ago at this point. I would imagine that Rick might. Well, we'll talk about that. There's no convol guys in the room, right? Well, from a storage perspective, that would be Fair, fair. Um, the problem with this is, again, it continues to just perpetuate this fragmentation throughout your data center, throughout your teams, throughout everything that's going on. You don't get to take advantage of the efficiencies across your entire data set. So things like dedupe are contained within a particular volume or a particular application, but you don't get to take advantage of those across everything that's in that kind of bottom of the iceberg there. And, and the analyst community, I believe Dark, Gartner actually has a definition for this that they call dark data. And this is what I refer to as anything from you know, uh, data going out with your users through shadow IT versus, you know, zombie snapshots that are just growing indefinitely that you've lost track of, test and dev environments that are sitting out there that nobody knows what the DBAs are doing with them anymore, but they don't want to let them go for some reason. So all this stuff just kind of forms this pool of dark data that you can't keep track of. So along the same lines of what Enrico was just talking about, what if we could combine some of the, some of the lessons we've learned from hyperconvergence over the last few years combining compute with storage and some of the different tiering methodologies that have come along and then insert some of the fundamentals of object storage like metadata, indexing, those sorts of things 
ball it all up together and really just collapse all of the stuff that was at the bottom of the iceberg. Ultimately, that's what we're calling hyperconverged secondary storage. And it's kind of a new space that we're, we're going out there trying to carve out because we feel that this is the next thing, right? There's been an object storage space that's very niche for some time now, but what we're seeing now is the, the insertion of object storage as a foundational layer to uh, layer those other services that you would think on top of that, right? Let's look at this in more of an architectural kind of a geek diagram, right? So you've got your physical servers, your virtual machines, your databases, and they're running on some kind of primary storage, some kind of all flash array, et cetera, some shared HA array. Um, but you gotta protect these things, right? You gotta run backups. They're necessary evil, we have to do them. So you put in a third party media server. It's gonna have some kind of catalog or catalog server instance that has to be associated with it. But you know that might be a net backup, for example. Uh, you may have some Veeam to come in and that's gonna write to a separate thing, right? And then you may have you know, RMAN or pushing out back files or something like that that's gonna have yet another way of doing these things, right? And then you've gotta figure out how to, what to do with them for long-term archives. So traditionally it's been tape. So that right there, just the data protection thing, that's, that can be two or three headcount within an organization if it's big enough, right? It's just, it's kind of a mess. But that doesn't, that is, secondary storage doesn't end there. When we talk about secondary stuff, it, it, it involves all of these things. So now you gotta think about tier two NAS, file shares, you know, everybody's home drives, your, your right, you know, different departments, your financial division, they need their own shared drive and whatnot. And now we've even got these things called cloud gateways. So the dirty little secret here is I actually designed this after the last big healthcare data center I ran. All right, this slide represents the last big data center I ran before I joined NetApp. That's where this came from. And this was, I was kind of a, one of two people running this whole thing. It was a nightmare. What if we could take, just initially, right? Continue to use your third party storage, but let's put something in that's a little bit more scalable and that, that just grows as you do and begins to just consolidate a lot of those target places. Well, this is what we refer to as scale out target storage. And there's a few different players in this market, but again, they're kind of just doing that same thing. They've built one product for one solution and that's their whole business, right? But what if we could then begin to collapse some of this other stuff, leveraging the object store stuff, replacing catalogs with indexes that are now give you search engines across all of your data and eliminating some of those media server components within there to run it natively on the cluster at the same time. Remember, the object handles the indexing stuff and we can layer on top of that uh, what we're doing as far as orchestration. Now we have integrated data protection. And the beauty of this is it runs fully in mixed mode. So you can actually run any combination of either one. You can run some of our integrated software directly off the box or you, and I should say, you can, at the same time, if you've got some little niche servers that maybe we don't have an agent yet for something like that, you can still connect to us via SMB or NFS. But once we've got all this stuff on there, what's stopping us from collapsing all the rest of it? We'll talk about some of the hardware that allows us to do this in just a moment, but this is what we're really talking about when we say hyperconverged secondary storage. Not only is it data protection, but we're also collapsing all of your file shares into one place. Uh, we're doing all of your test, test and dev environments by spinning up those backups into test and dev instances in really fast instant snapshot capabilities. Our cloud archival and tiering uh, options are built right into your data protection policies. So you can send that data off right to the cloud or any other external target that might be S3 compliant. Uh, and lastly, one of my favorite things to talk about is analytics, right? Once you have all this data in one place and you've got metadata associated with everything, now you get to do some really fun analytics around it. Because what we've been missing in the past is the metadata, right? Object storage has had a hold on that metadata for some time now. But once we start building the object fundamentals into enterprise storage, you just get instant access to some of those reports, you know, consumption reports around uh, storage consumption by user, by file type, by backup job, by virtual machine, all that stuff just is in a drop-down box, instantly available. The idea here is the, it's, it's fully a consolidation play that ultimately leads to lower TCO, exactly what Enrico was just saying a little bit ago. Um, this isn't to, uh, uh, to show any kind of adoption model or anything like that, but really it's just to highlight the simplicity, simplicity you get from implementation, the control you get of managing it on a day-to-day -day basis, and most importantly, the efficiencies that you see across your entire data set now. Not just a volume, not just a node, your entire cluster uh, that spans all of that stuff. So I've, I've used the word platform a couple of times, and I wanna highlight that it is a platform. I like to use the smartphone analogy Smartphones come out, it's a piece of hardware, it's got a proprietary OS on it, 
out of the box, it's got some native apps and use cases, but it's extensible and you can extend so you can put Facebook on it, right? That's really what it comes down to. Same kind of concept here. It's a Intel based uh, x86 box, off the shelf components, really cost effective. Um, but at the end of the day, in a 2U appliance, we're able to deliver almost 100 terabytes of raw disk, HGST, Mark, where'd you go? Eight terabyte drives from HGST, the helium filled ones, right? <laughs> yeah. I love you guys. <laughs> the rest of it's Intel. Everything except the drives are Intel, so we, we'll, we'll do for that. Uh, every node has two eight core Xeons. Wow, that's a lot of horsepower for that stuff. And, you know, we'll get back to some of that reasons why. Uh, six and a half terabytes of PCIe MLC flash, again from Intel, that lives in every single node. Or sorry, 1.6 in each node. Six and a half across a four node config. And every node has two of its own 10 gig ports. And a lot of what we do on the software side uh, has to do with creating VIPs and consolidating a lot of that stuff across uh, everything there. So that was just kind of a off the shelf x86 box, right? This is where the sweet sauce is. And I apologize the colors are kind of messing up the clarity of that. But at the bottom, we start with the customized NoSQL store that we've built. Uh, this allows us to do a lot of the, uh, the metadata operations and keeping track of those things. Uh, the self healer is huge. This is one of the things that really just rebuilds those replication uh, relationships across nodes. We do an RF2, replication factor of two. That is tunable. We have one financial customer that's doing RF3 right now. Just, you just have to redo the math on the capacities when you do that. Um, the other big things to call out is SnapTree right in the middle. This is our patented new thing. This is kind of the hub of our wheel. Everything that we do around snapshots, around provisioning clones, recovering backups, all of that is, is the way that we do uh, or enables us to do everything is via SnapTree. Um, QoS is built in at many, many layers throughout it, whether you're creating a backup job, whether you're creating a target space, whether you're provisioning test and dev instances, you have a low, medium, high slider that you can, you can set it. So in a way, you can tailor the box, box's performance to uh, be whatever you want it to use, use it for. Distributed NFS, distributed SMB, both built in-house. Uh, our founder, Mohit Aran, from originally co-founded Nutanix, was a CTO over there for a while. Previous to that, did Google File System. So a huge pedigree of distributed NFS uh, coming into this system as well. Replication, compression, encryption. I mean, if you have a, a storage vendor that's not doing those things today, please excuse them from the room. Those are table stakes at this point. They absolutely uh, must happen. AES 256-bit uh, encryption uh, on the box natively. So use cases, I want to go through these really quick. Um, we'll highlight a few things. The big one I want to highlight here is policy-driven everything. So about eight months ago or so, before we actually GA'd in October, we had a way of that we were going to do jobs, and it was very classic in the sense of you have a backup job, you define a set of data, and it runs on a schedule, right? Well, we took a big step backwards and went, wait, it's 2016, 2015 at the time. We need to do this differently. We need to just do everything with policies. So that's what we've done. Every time you go in and you define a data set, you just pick a policy. The policy is going to define everything that you do from an RTO perspective, whether it replicates to another box off-site, uh, if it's going to archive to the cloud, et cetera. Um, so the beauty of this is that we can operate again in a mixed mode environment. So any of these third parties that you use, we can absolutely be a target. We just become a fun scale out version of that target rather than the purpose built appliances or the traditional HA pairs that you've probably been using. The integrated data protection today, it's VMware, Oracle, MS SQL is coming very soon. And replication and archival are both built in there as well. By archival, I mean any kind of S3 compliant uh, communication can happen or uh, the native replication that we have, the efficient replication between our native boxes. Right. File shares, uh, this is you know, native to everybody, or, or you know, everybody has to do file shares, everybody has to do uh, home drives and whatnot. The beauty of this is because of the replication factor and the way we write across nodes, across racks, across clusters, uh, um, or across chassis, I should say, not clusters, the, uh, the data is inherently protected. So by putting your files on, your home drives and stuff like that onto the box, you get this kind of strictly consistent native uh, protection just by doing that. And of course, you can replicate it off or vault them off to something else if you'd like. But there is that kind of first layer of protection just by hosting them on us without having to deal with things like RAID and LUNs and disks and all those kinds of things that you would with a traditional system. Full Active Directory integration, you can literally add the cluster as a computer account to get a lot of those permissions to come down. Uh, and native file and object protocols, SM NFS, SMB, and S3 support across the board. Uh, test and dev, this is what I say, I like to call this the shopping cart model. 
it's kind of a new way to do this. So we have two ways that we do recovery and cloning. It's all done through the search engine. Basically, you search for what you're looking for, whether it's a file, whether it's a VM, and then you can add it to cart. Because you're sometimes when testing dev scenarios, or I would say argue most of the time, you're not just going to test uh, one machine. You're going to have multiple machines. So why not have a fun add to cart? So search for your machine, add it. And when you build up your package of uh, virtual machines, simply hit continue. We'll orchestrate the build up. And we even do the tear down as well after the fact to clean all of that stuff up. But you can isolate it into a specific vSwitch. You can give it a custom name. You can pick where, what uh, data store you want it to go on. The other thing is that we can stand this up directly on our box without affecting your production storage. So recoveries, we will do a SV motion to put it back on your production storage. But from a test and dev perspective, we literally stand that up directly on our box so that it does not impact anything there. Analytics, this is where this all gets useful because data protection, you know, it's a necessary evil. We have to do it. Everybody has to do backups, right? But let's make it as simple as possible and get, at it, get it out of the way. File shares, everybody's got to have their home drives. Your departments have to have their shares. Let's make it as simple as possible. Consolidate it all down. Get it out of the way. Test and dev, they, they got to have their instances. Again, simple as possible. Get it out of the way. But now that we've got all this stuff, again, on one cluster, indexed, fully searchable, now we can take it one step further. We can begin to do some, some not just reporting, but we can make it data forensics at this point. Now you get into things like e-discovery, you get into um, being able to build custom queries, custom Java applications that look for things like pattern matching for credit card numbers, social security numbers, et cetera. And you can literally run that as a process, scheduled process on the system, alert on it when it finds a file and then trigger an action after the fact. So let's run through a scenario real quick. You're running a scan, you've, you've put in a pattern, the slash D slash D slash D, uh, that looks like a social security number. Anytime it finds that file, you can take it and uh, have an action that triggers off of that to isolate it into something, into a pool, you know, a different area of the cluster, right? Then you can go as an admin or as a follow-up, take action on it once you've gotten the email, the alert. This is kind of the advanced end of the slider from, uh, you know, what we do in the enterprise. Uh, you have direct access to the code. You have direct access to the MapReduce. So if you want to get into that kind of stuff, it's absolutely doable. And we're going to deliver some of these out of the box over time so that when you, and hopefully even build this ecosystem between the partners and the vendors, an app store of sorts where they can come in and grab these little apps, drop them on to do certain kinds of queries and stuff like that. A little bit more longer term vision once we get past all the enterprisey stuff that we're working on today. So lastly, this is the Nirvana state, really. Uh, you know, let's get rid of all of those systems that we want to, that are, we're dealing with today, all the individual individual little siloed problems, collapse them all together into one single pane of glass. I know everybody loves that phrase, don't they? Uh, global dedupe across all of that. You get your efficiencies across all these different verticals of data and true web scale by just ability, the ability of just adding nodes, right? The last thing I want to highlight on that part is full heterogeneous. So as processors and disks evolve, they change, they get more cores. Intel just announced a 22 core processor recently. So the, the, the nodes are going to work together, is, I guess is what I'm getting at. So you, ha you end up with this cluster of many, many nodes, and maybe you can separate the workloads within partitioning or different logical separation, but you all, it all works together. The file system does not differentiate. <coughs> a couple of things I want to highlight on cloud integrations here. Um, you may have seen some stuff, some blog posts and we've been putting out recently around this. We had a big launch event a couple of weeks ago uh, about this. We're really happy to get this stuff out there. One of the problems with cloud is you hear people, somebody say cloud, and they go, ah, cloud, right? Eh, people don't know what to do with it. They don't know whether they want to run applications. They don't know how to consume it in a particular use case. So we were really strategic about honing in on what can the enterprise really use the cloud for in a traditional day-to-day -day sense. And it really comes down to a couple of different things. Um, Long-term archival is what we're referring to first here. And we call that cloud archive. And it's the ability to register an external target with your cluster, KCD cluster, and shuttle data off as part of your backup policies. So at first, when you take a backup, you can build it into the policy for a copy of that data and its associated index to go off to the cloud, right? So you're, in, you're archiving your contents, you've got your index, and as the diagram here shows, we're encrypting that in flight, and we're even gonna encrypt the encryption keys in the cloud next to it. So you don't lose any of that data, uh, it all stays offline, and if in a smoking hole scenario where California has that 10.0 earthquake that we've all been waiting for. I live in Los Angeles, by the way. Um, it's, you know, we get the, all of our data back and we can simply just pull it back in, right? 
The big thing I want to highlight here is, again, policy-driven everything. This is all just part of your policies uh, around data protection to move that stuff off. And again, full support for off-site replication. We, use, uh, we have some integrations with a third party to continue to do tape. Most of the tape stuff is fiber channel. We're doing Ethernet. So we have, uh, kind of have a proxy to do that. So if you do have tape, we can continue to do that for you there. Cloud tier is, uh, is really exciting here. We have a lot of customers that have started turning this on and are seeing massive savings. Basically here, this continues to add a third layer to the waterfall of the life cycle of your data. So uh, chunk file hotness coined by Mr. Alex here. Basically, the, the idea is that as your data comes in, it starts a cycle. It goes to the SSDs first. As it cools down, it, it goes down to the disks. And if you add an external target as a cloud tier, as it cools down, let's say 60 days last touched or more, we can seamlessly shuttle it off to this external capacity that you can register in the num numerous cloud providers. Um, Microsoft just announced their Azure Cool. Uh, that's a new one that we've uh, partnered up with. So the beauty of this is that um, you can save hundreds of gigabytes, if not terabytes, of just dead data that's sitting there stale without losing access to it, without losing the visibility of it, and without uh, eating up expensive capacity on this side. Now you have a cheap tier that you can move it off to intelligently. Uh, lastly, one of the things we're going to be introducing soon is uh, we're calling it Cloud Replicate, but the idea here ultimately is to run our software as a EC2 instance in Amazon. And we're going to do it with other vendors eventually, but we're going to start with, with AWS. The beauty here is that now you have a, a like-minded storage controller in the cloud. So you can do native replication uh, off-site. It satisfies those audited off-site requirements, right, regulations, as well at the same time as leverage that data set to begin to do test and dev and other things in the cloud. So this becomes a storage controller to storage controller, native efficiency, uh, or native efficient replication to be able to do these things. Gives you a level of active failover to the cloud as well. Would the back end be EC2 storage or S3 storage? Great question. You can choose what you want. If you want it to be Glacier, EBS, S3, whatever you want it to be. So when you go into AWS and you choose, I want to buy a, I want to buy 10 instances of Cohesity Oasis, uh, it'll ask you right there your other configuration options. You can choose which ones. We'll have all that out very soon. So I will close by saying, are we all sadists? Are we tired of doing this yet? Seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of tired of it, right? I'd, I'd much rather have something that was a lot more elegant like that. Pick your primary storage of choice, but take a lot of the, the benefits that you get from uh, hyperconvergence around the simplifying of a deployment of infrastructure, introduce object storage fundamentals to really gain a lot of visibility around that stuff, and consolidate. That's really what it comes down to. Consolidate, lower your costs, simplify your environment. Thank you very much. I, I guess I should ask if there's any questions first, but I wanted to be time friendly. Yes, Chris. So it would be without having to go to uh, a separate gateway would be the first step, would be the first. You are the gateway. Essentially. We're, we're registering uh, either Glacier or AWS as an external target within our system. So literally, you'll pull up our UI. You put in the, um, the, which service you're using, your credentials and your secret keys and all that stuff that they give you for the cloud provider, and it registers that as an external target. Then you go back to your policy, and you choose to add an additional <coughs> schedule choose that external target and tell it how often you want it to do it. So we're building it in as a part of the policy on top of traditional data protection methods. Anybody else? Yep. Um, I loved your question earlier about Nutanix, by the way. You just described it backwards. And I wanted to jump up. <laughs> you got to do the object foundation first, and then you can do all the other file systems on top of it. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so I was thinking about the fact that there are a lot of primary storage vendors out there. There isn't any, like Chris mentioned in the beginning with hierarchical storage management. Mm -hmm. Basically what you guys have to do is have to integrate with whatever, with a lot of primary storage vendors out there. Is that correct? I would say define integrate. Yeah. Um, we, there are a lot of, sure. Make, make yourself as a target for them, right? Bingo. To get the data. Yep. 
So there's a lot of them that, uh, so Pure Storage is the best example of this. We've, we've very visibly and publicly um, gotten in bed with Pure Storage because they do a lot of the things that we don't do and we do a lot of the things that they don't do. So it's a very good marriage of the two technologies to sit right next to each other as a primary, secondary. Um, we've got papers out there for Tejile, for vSAN. So absolutely, we want to get in bed or partner with as much of those as we can, right? So that absolutely makes a lot of sense. One thing we're taking the extra mile on with Pure is we're actually, not only are we doing a go-to-market stack kind of solution with them through the channel to be able to, to sell that whole solution, but we're also doing some engineering efforts on the back end, which we'll see more of probably later this, this summer, later this year maybe, where we might show up in each other's UI, we start talking about offloading snapshots and getting a little more engineering integration going on there. Yeah, but the engineering challenge is going to be a big one if you want to integrate with a lot of people out there because everybody yes. has their own API. Everybody's unique, and yes. yes. That's yeah, we're that we're challenge. we're betting on pure. Yeah, they're they're kind oh, okay. of the one that's been successful, to be honest. Oh, okay. Right. Anybody else? There was one other hand I saw over here. Yes. Uh, what do you mean by providing native map reviews? Providing that so the whole team is Google engineers, uh, and they that's it's a kind of a Google invention. Uh, the the mappers and the reducers to consolidate a lot of that data down, right? When we, you can literally go into the analytics workbench and clone the mappers and the reducer that you want, if it's a sum or whatever that might be, to build your own custom application, <clears throat> giving you access to those indices already. So you don't have to go in and scrub the data for the things you've got access to it already, mm -hmm. just by getting in, just writing your own code, dropping it into the box. Uh, what languages support? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know for sure. I want to say Go is supported, and I want to say Python off the top of my head. Uh, Java is definitely supported as well, uh, but you can, you can either paste your own code into the paste bin or you can upload a jar file if you've already got the application built in your own IDE. Cool. Yes, Chris. Listening to what you said, mm -hmm. the cohesive view array can consolidate vast different sets of secondary storage. Is there some common trigger for your customers to start buying a cohesive system? That's one. And two, So one, what hurts the most? Usually it's data protection. Um, we see a lot of people that have uh, very expensive tier two NAS solutions being used as backup targets. And we think that's a great place to not only replace some of the PBBA uh, appliances that are out there, but lower the cost of backup targets that they're typically using a, a filer or some other shared array controller for uh, and come in and undercut that with a lot more capabilities than what that shared controller could apply. Uh, the second one, repeat that for me. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> we see that, yeah. I don't know if it's a direct strategy of the company to do that from a sales or go-to-market perspective, but I, that makes it usually makes a lot of sense. Dip the toe in the water first. No complete evacuation or failure or uh, dumping everything onto us right away. We'd be more than happy for them to do that. Uh, obviously, but that's just not what we're seeing. We're seeing people usually tr start with things like VMware backup or scale out target with a third party and then expand from there. But yeah, the more they use it, the more they tend to fall in love with it and want to do other things with it. Yes? Your integration with things like Veeam and Net Backup, that was one thing on the slide that then got all sucked together. Would yeah. you, I hate to say in front of Rick, would you be sure. wanting to to replace the, the Veeam or the Net Backup or Commvault functionality that is the actual backup worker as well? So, I, just being and, and, and Rick and I have talked about this plenty and, and, the, my, and Cade and the other guys. So it behooves both of us to work together than be at each other. So it really ultimately is best for us to just stay out of that fight and let the customer pick what they want. Customers love Veeam. They, they continue to want to use Veeam. We in no way want to displace that if they don't want to use us for that kind of stuff. Can we do everything that Veeam can do today? Not yet. Uh, we can trigger some VADP backups just like everybody else does, sure. Um, but there's a lot more that Veeam brings to the table, so we'd rather work with them and be that scale-out target. Uh, for a lot of customers that want to use, just want to have a more elegant scale-out target solution and stick with what they're, they're used to. Be the arms dealer, let the market yeah. decide. Yeah, I'll let them, <laughs> we'll let the market decide, absolutely. The same goes for, um, I almost said semantic. Same goes for net backup, same goes for Commvault, all those guys. We can present SMB and NFS just like anybody else. We just have a more elegant back end that allows you to scale it out better. So, so 
currently now you are the back end, the target for any backup product. Sure. But going forward, you can do more things and potentially replace backup products. Sure. Now, ultimately, that decision is going to be left to the customer, though, to do what they want to with it.